Join me for an exciting webinar with Supply Chain Brain featuring trade experts from Thomson Reuters, Ernest & Young, and Georgia Pacific. We'll explore key insights from Thomson Reuters' 2023 State of Global Trade Report, provide valuable tips on leveraging global trade technology to support your talent, and discuss the expanding responsibilities of ESG reporting in the supply chain. What is it? Anxiety? Anxiety is a thing. Anxiety is a thing. Is it a first world problem? Yeah, I know. Well, welcome to Anxiety. <laughs> I mean, Freightonomics, uh, the show where we talk about the macroeconomic and freight market dynamics going on out there using data to make you feel a little bit better about it. Maybe. Uh, out there. I'm Zach Strickland, uh, head of market intelligence. Anthony Smith, as always, chief, chief economist here. Uh, you know, and, you know, we're talking about anxiety before the show. And I think that's the way that I would describe most people's outlook on the economy in 2024. 100%. And I think <laughs> it's one of those things where you just pull in so much. You have so much data, so much insights. You know where you, you just kind of can't look away. Yeah. And then that anxiety kind of comes over. And then it's just like you have this paralysis of like, you know what? I'm looking at too much. Was it the paralysis by analysis or whatever it's the same? Yeah, yeah. But that anxiety, I think, is one of those precursors before that. But we're here to set you all at ease. At from ease. Hopefully our, at ease. I don't hopefully. know. Sometimes the data doesn't really let you feel safe. But we're at least going to let you get set up for what's <laughs> about to happen. Speaking about setting up, Zach, yeah. i got to set you up because we have something amazing that's happened. Yeah. We have a huge shout out. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if there are any children watching Freightonomics that are interested in Freight and Economics, I have news for you. We're sponsored once again. Yeah. And we have the lovely folks at Thomson Reuters to think for that. I mean, Thomson Reuters, uh, the 2023 Corporate Global Trade Survey Report from Thomson Reuters is here, and you don't want to miss this. Navigate the ever-changing trade environment with insights into hot topics like the skills gap, ESG reporting, ongoing and upcoming industry developments, and more by getting your free copy today. Download now at the link on your screen. Man, it feels like that's a, that's such a good fit for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and uh, there's you know time we we're always appreciative of sponsorships yeah. whenever we do get those here on Friday sure. But this is definitely one where we feel like you know what this fits right into what we're talking about 100%. on a weekly basis, <laughs> and it's definitely a a a great partnership, and we're looking forward to hopefully continuing that as the year continues and goes into 2024. But Zach, I titled this show mm -hmm. how yeah. soon is too soon yeah. and i think that's one of the areas where we kind of see some points of anxiety is really kind of being able to make a call and one of the calls from the econ side is soft landing is here yeah and yeah <laughs> we've been talking about this soft landing for yeah. a long time now it and it and it seems to be it, like still in the cards potentially right it, it's it's there potentially and then i think the other side of how soon is too soon is the end or how will we see the freight recession progress? Mm -hmm. How soon is too soon to call it? Yeah. And I think it's too soon to say that we are in a, a, a soft landing because I think that this- Well, we've got some weird seasonality stuff and yeah. we still are dealing with like this post COVID transitional like disconnect. Right. <laughs> For lack of a better word to describe chaos. <laughs> <laughs> also, I, I forgot to mention, uh, I'll be looking down from time to time because we are streaming live. If you're watching 12 Eastern time, on LinkedIn or YouTube. So if you want to join in the conversation, have a question, what you might be anxious about, whatever it might be, join in on the conversation here on LinkedIn or on YouTube, and you'll be a part of the show. But Zach, you're exactly right. It's just so many different variables that have really piled up since the days of COVID. And now looking at to where we are right now, there was this lull, like, as you mentioned before the show, after Thanksgiving, no. and now things start to, a little bit to be picking up again. And I wonder if it's just people going through the motions to see if the other person or see if they can pull some information or some insights out, or if it's all legitimate that I need to know this, I need to know that, but it's all kind of anxiety. -ridden. I think it was everybody be shopping. 
mm. uh, after Thanksgiving. And I think it takes a minute. Once you get into that mentality of Christmas break and vacations, it takes you a minute to kind of break yourself out of out of some of this. I, I'm, again, psychology minor here, uh, but it's always interesting to me at how human behavior manifests itself in economics, yeah, you know, and I think that's something that you almost have to be more of a psychologist than you do an economist at times uh, to read what's going on. Yeah, I mean, they say it's a social science, and I think that's <laughs> that's definitely the social side. And economics is like the 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 kid that no one really wants, and sometimes in academia, like you know, you're not a hard science, you don't belong over here. No, you're not really a part of us either. So it's it's definitely one of those intricate things. And I oh, think I could exactly go on and on about how that's that's a flawed argument. <laughs> uh, but I've that's heard not it so that's for times. another that's for another show. Yeah, I've heard it so many times, and so I just like to stay out of it. But what we do see on those things is it's kind of like a self uh, self fulfilling prophecy a lot of times, especially when you're looking at um, any types of supply shocks where people are running up on certain types of goods, any kinds of, hey, there's going to be a recession. You kind of talk yourself into certain types of recessions. So there's these types of things that happens from a psychological standpoint. Mm -hmm. But right now, I think the mindset that, hey, we have achieved a soft landing is dangerous because it can lull us into a dangerous area where if we think that this isn't a soft landing and we think that, okay, this is the worst it's going to get from a macroeconomic standpoint, you're not going to be doing the things to prepare yourself for worsening conditions moving forward. You know what? I have some data to address some of these things. No, we, I for, we and, just skipped right over the marketing too, didn't we? I mean, we got we got into it right okay, away. Okay, That's okay. all right. And Frazier was messing with here. some of the themes. I want the 80s theme, if you can control that, Frazier. I love Frazier the Thomas that? Wasson 80s theme on this oh. one. <laughs> Frazier, make it happen, please. <laughs> all right. But we do have the market in two, and I will count Zach in in three, two, one, go. Oh, we have a counter. Wow, look at that. Look so yeah, AI. starting things off, OTVI, I think this is probably one of the more relevant indices, although a lot of transportation service providers are not going to think this is like the best thing for them to look at right now because demand is up. If you look at the OTVI over the last several weeks since October, we're actually still trending higher for the year coming out of what looks like the deepest troughs uh, of the year early in January, February, as you would expect. But the, the kind of this pull forward that we thought was a pull forward for the holiday season persisted outside of this October depression that you saw there. And we're still seeing relative strength here. If you look at previous years on this chart, um, you know, the COVID years, of course, we saw a dramatic decline in demand in OTVI after the holidays. We're still a little early to say that it's not going to drop. It will drop eventually. Uh, but the relative strength year over year on the post-Thanksgiving era like, or the post-COVID era is, is actually quite interesting because it means that people are still shipping a lot of freight. Demand is still not the issue in the freight market. Let's go to the next one. What is the problem in the freight market? The OTRI, the Outbound Tender Rejection Index, which measures the percentage of those loads that are being rejected by carriers, is on the floor. This is one of the indexes. Uh, you know, 3.79% uh, near historical lows, especially this time of year. Capacity is readily available. Carriers are sucking up everything they can. Uh, let's move on into something else. <laughs> uh, the next chart here, the Ontario market uh, is what I'm going to pull up next for the outbound tender volumes. So there's been a shift. Capacity is readily available, but underneath all of this, the Ontario market is growing. This is a growth market. There's all this freight coming into the ports and it's still moving across the country, something we're going to talk about a little later. At the uh, other end of the equation, the next chart here, the last chart, the Atlanta market, OTVI, it's up a little bit, but it's still pretty soft. So we are seeing strength returning mm. to the western side of the United States thanks to the imports and of course we have Panama Canal we've got a story that we're going to talk about I don't want to get too in the weeds on it just yet but and we've got the geopolitical stuff going on in the Middle East which never seems to end but these are things that are helping I talked about on freight waves now earlier this morning move freight patterns back to a pre-COVID level now, Ontario volumes and demand, why, why are they important? <laughs> it's because they are sitting at the end of the world in terms of like where carriers have to traverse. They travel over what we call the freight desert, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the mountains and plains and a literal desert <laughs> uh, where people don't really live or produce a lot of stuff. Uh, Phoenix, of course, has been a growth market this year uh, with all those DCs. It's cheaper real estate, et cetera. Uh, but still, you, from Dallas 
to about Phoenix, there's almost nothing. Right. Uh, so that, that makes it really hard. If you're an over the road carrier hauling freight from one point to another, you have to drive all the way, you know, 2000 miles, one direction with no freight in general, somebody's driving empty, <laughs> uh, because there's way more freight coming out of Southern California than going in. <laughs> and that's just not very efficient. <laughs> Yeah, and let's talk about that because for a while, um, as you kind of alluded to earlier, there was, um, of course, there was some propping ups and more volume on the East Coast. That was happening for quite a bit. And then we saw, all right, is this a new thing? Or are we just going to see the, the dominance of the East Coast as West Coast over? And that's not the case. I mean, of course, there's just too many conveniences and infrastructure. Exactly. There's just so many different things that go into place yeah. in the West Coast. But what are going to be some of the factors that you're seeing that's driving some of those West Coast volumes now um, compared to what we saw, of course, there were a whole bunch of other variables that really drove some of those factors over to the East Coast? Yeah, I think, well underpinning all of this is is the macroeconomic question that we kind of pose to start the market into is is this a soft landing are we out of the woods mm -hmm. like in terms of overall economic softness and the answer is definitively no <laughs> uh because when you see ontario volume growth what does that mean it means that there's a lot of warehouse freight moving across the country <laughs> In general, it's moving. There there have been instances, like with the trade war, we saw a bunch of pull forward of imports coming in, and it would just sit in a warehouse. Right. That's not what's happening now. If you break down the Ontario demand, it is long-haul freight moving across the country. We see it in the rail volumes, too. If you watch Mike Bowden-Distal and Joanna Marsh, <laughs> uh, that, you know, on people speaking rail, there's been a resurgence, a resilience of intermodal growth uh, moving across the country. Um, intermodal is long-haul freight. <laughs> So that is going to replenish those downstream providers, uh, the retailers, the fulfillment centers, which are all close to the population centers on the East Coast. During the pandemic, <laughs> we saw a shift of that volume go to the East Coast because the West Coast port and drayage and all, the, all that was congested. The railheads, all congested. Mm -hmm. So it was like, how do we get around this? And then it became cost effective to actually bypass all that and service effective. So the value of shipping to the East Coast became increasingly higher. I wrote a chart of the week about this, if you're interested. Um, and since the pandemic ended, that's now gone away and the value of shipping to the West Coast has increased. I mean, and I think also speaking of chart of the week, you also have an article that I think was very, uh, prolific and forecasting a potential trend that we'll also get to in, in just a few moments here, but kind of getting into our first let's news. Just, yeah, let's go in the news, news and comments. This is actually a perfect transition. Yeah. <laughs> so the first one, we were talking around imports, and I think yeah. you, you hit the nail on the head. This is perfect transition here. And this was an article that was put out not too long ago on Freightways talking about imports being dragged down by seasonal Panama Canal crisis. And this one was put out by Greg Miller, and he outlines a lot of really interesting trends here. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have to kind of be mindful of those easier comps as well. Yeah, last year we were talking about inventory destocking mm -hmm. and everybody selling off all their overstock of stuff. Because, I mean, if you think about it, it was a very slow process to get to the point of recognizing they had too much, too many goods. Right. Then they were like, well, should we stop ordering? And that took them a few more months. And then once they stopped ordering, it took another like, eight weeks before the backlogs and all the other congestion processes got fully flushed out. So we were months down the line before they actually got to a point where they could start to destock. Yeah. <laughs> and that's after recognition. So it almost took them a full year between recognition uh, to getting to the beginning of destocking. So this time last year, they were like, we're not ordering anything. <laughs> so that's why import comps uh, are, are pretty strong. But he's also under pit, like he also suggests in the article that the eastern half of the country ports have lost more ground than the western. Mm. So he's saying sequentially imports are down to uh, some of this has to do with the golden week period, I think, as well. That's the question uh, in China. But I, I think the big driving uh, points in this article are East Coast is losing share. <laughs> And volumes are, are starting to slow down as they do traditionally uh, in, in some regard. And we're starting to see, of course, that we always see that China is an influence here, continues to drive some uh, U.S. imports. And so that activity is still somewhat there overall. 
Also, when we're looking at, um, I think, the import activity, it was interesting when we saw the Panama Canal crisis, yeah. initially that lack of urgency yeah. from a lot of those upstream of like, it's not going to be expedited. We're not looking for an alternate route. We're just going to stay our course, and this is the way we're going to go. Yeah, no, nobody cares. No one cares. I, I it was that no one cares. No one cares meme. I could, I could have brought it back this week. Uh, it, it's because they don't. They're not in a hurry. The sense of urgency is gone. Yeah, you know, they they have plenty of goods as they see it, but when they don't, they're able to get away with it by shipping right away at almost the exact same price. Right. <laughs> So I, I think that's why we also see this trend, trend of shifting back to the West Coast because it it just makes too much sense from a cost value perspective. Uh, one show we should absolutely do on economic value. Like I think that's that's a lost concept. Yeah. In in the way that people view things, that everybody looks at things in like dollar values, but what are you getting for your dollar? You yeah, know? and I think that other aspect of being able to get those same rates if you just ship immediately, mm -hmm. there is no urgency that's being built up because like, hey, it's going to cost me the same thing. Yeah. Why am I going to try to lock this in earlier if it's if I don't need it there now? And right. so I think there is that aspect. Then there's a, that there's that foregone cost yeah. that that also kind of factors into that somewhat as well. And so I think we could definitely edge out a show all around that topic yeah. for sure. But but I mean, at the bare minimum, economically speaking, it looks like the consumers are doing just fine and companies are still, they're still shipping, like yeah. relatively high volumes. I think it's too early, as you said, <laughs> to call like the are out of the woods because we need to get out of this seasonality and we need to get out of this inventory management shift. Like we've just shifted from last year where we're destocking aggressively to this year where we have relatively balanced inventory levels and, a, you know, consumers are still resilient. I think early quarter or early next year, the first quarter, we'll have a little bit more uh, clarity around that too. Um, the next uh, article here I want to touch on here is the forward airs tonnage inflex, inflex further upward in Q4. Now this kind of contradicts everything I just said, <laughs> uh, sort of, but not really because forward air is an air for a freight forwarder air freight. It's mainly expedited mm -hmm. type. It's not expedited truly, but it is like a, if people need service guaranteed right. <laughs> type situation, uh, it goes between airport, major airports, not really, they're terminals there, but, um, and they had a 5.5% 5 5 tonnage increase for October, November period. Uh, and your boy, as you called out <laughs> earlier, wrote an article about this, not just like three weeks ago, saying diminished inventories may boost holiday expediting. Look it up on FreightWaves.com. Was that a chart of the week as well? It was. It was a chart Boom. of the week. Uh, and that's really what their CEO talks about in the article is saying, look, we're having favorable comps from a year-over-year -year perspective, but we're also seeing an uptick in these expedited or guaranteed service shipments. Uh, yellow exit also contributing as well, but they don't really see that naturally at Forward Air. They weren't like a true competitor one-to-one. -one. Right. Uh, they see a little bit more spot freight. And they've already kind of ingested that. But the the fact that they are seeing some of this more service critical is exactly why this inventory tightness narrative that I've been talking about is so important to freight. <laughs> yeah, and we also had some great talking points from Zach Rogers around mm -hmm. some of those inventory situations. And ladies and gentlemen, excited to say that Zach Rogers is planning on being here next week as well. So Man, definitely go stay tuned for that one and get your LMI pre-Christmas uh, holiday season episode in. Yeah. Um, but as we're kind of mentioning being too soon to call something, mm -hmm. that first quarter of 24 mm -hmm. is exactly when I'm looking for, all right, if we can make it past this yeah. moment, I would be more on board with a potential soft landing when my idea of a soft landing is kicking the bucket a little bit further down the road and just making it an issue that might have to be dealt with a little bit later on. But when I'm looking at that first quarter right. here, I'm looking at a mix of those consumer trends. So of course, we're seeing the labor market starting to show some signs of easing. I said this, I think maybe months ago, maybe even quarters really ago. really long time ago. <laughs> uh, especially, I think I did an episode with um, South and just kind of breaking down what the talking points are going to be once we start to hit lower numbers on the job openings of like, 
9 million to 8 million and 7 million, 6 million, a lot of the talking points are going to be like, hey, it's still high historically. Yeah. And then we're going to see creeping delinquency rates and people will say, hey, it's still low historically. Yeah. And I think we will get caught in this still mind frame and be lulled into this this phase of, hey, this is a soft landing, we're here. And I think that's a dangerous place for not just businesses, but also for a lot of consumers as well. Because if people are spinning as if this is a soft landing and they're not preparing themselves, and if businesses aren't preparing themselves, here comes more potential layoffs, furloughs, whatever it might be. And then also a lot of individuals being stuck in really awful financial situations because right now the labor market has been supporting all these purchases and consumptions overall. Where, where do you take on the housing market right now? It, it seems like the inventories for available housing were tight initially, and that kept the market a little bit more active or yeah. I guess appearing to be in better condition than it actually was. But now like nobody's buying a house, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the housing market is interesting. So I think definitely that when we're looking at um, of course, inventory levels are just still very low, historically speaking, mm -hmm. um, keeping in that still mind frame as well. We're looking at um, the backlog of homes. That's incredibly high. So we're looking at homes that have been authorized but not yet started. That's at historic highs. We're looking at homes that are under construction. That's at historic highs. We're looking at permits as at historic highs. When you're looking at housing starts from the U.S. Census Bureau, a housing start is when ground has been broken. Doesn't mean that there's framing material up. There doesn't mean that there is a foundation laid out. So it just means that ground has been broken. So this can be various stages of a construction project. And the fact is, is that these things are just being put on a backlog and that the housing purchases are really being constricted by these increases, increases in mortgage rates. And that's really starting to limit the amount of purchases and activities that's going on. Builder sentiment is down. The HPC, uh, HPSI, the Home Purchasing Sentiment Index, mm -hmm. um, HPSI, the HIPSI yeah. uh, from Fannie Mae, <laughs> is definitely showing that a lot of consumers are still feeling like this is historically an awful time to buy a house. And so this is all kind of going into that housing market mindset. I think it's making it difficult for a lot of individuals. And then, of course, we have this monstrosity, I think, that might be building on the multifam segment as well in terms of what's going on over there. Also on the single family side, zoning laws are also limiting how many homes can be put in some different metropolitan areas. So that's also going to be an issue. I think that it's going to really kind of hold off on a lot of single family developments as well. Man, you just said a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like, so hot take next year, what's the housing market do? So there's been a lot of talks. I don't like trying to forecast what the Fed is going to do in terms of interest rates. Don't worry about that. Guy. Going up. And up. <laughs> so there's a lot of talks around, like, all right, the yeah. Fed's going to drop interest rates, going to drop interest rates. Um, if that does happen, I think that will support more um, home trade. You can actually. caveat it by saying, if the Fed does this. Yeah, I think if the Fed does come down on the interest mm -hmm. rates, I think we'll Which start Which a lot of people think is going to happen. Yeah, a lot of people think it's going to happen. But that also tells me that we're heading into a, a downturn. Yeah, if, right? you, if you're anticipating that the Fed is going to do that, that means that the Fed needs to do that in right. order to kind of save the economy from crashing too hard. Mm -hmm. But the other big thing is we also haven't fully defeated inflation. So if the Fed comes down the on interest inflation. rates, the, the inflation <laughs> enemy, if the Fed comes down too fast, too soon, yeah. that can undo a lot of the progress that we've made. Right. And so that just kind of cons pushes that consumption again. And so I think in 2024, when we look at the housing market, I think we'll see some potential disruption in the multifam segment. Mm -hmm. I think that one could be um, primed for some shakeups. I think um, we're looking at if there is a significant shift in the labor market, that would definitely also... You think the labor market's going to continue to erode? I think so. Um, I think the good news is, is that it's so buffed up right now <laughs> it's so huge it can take it <laughs> yeah but i at the same time i'm i'm nervous and that anxiety hits me because i don't think it's really over eight million job openings out there i don't think i heard janet yellen talking some smack the other day about oh i thought and, and she was calling out people that said that it was going to take significant labor market erosion to get inflation under control yeah which she was basically responding saying where are you at because we're still right here. <laughs> I, I, and, and I think Janet Yellen is, I think all those folks are, are brilliant because right. they have a job. They have to talk in certain ways to know that they ha can't reveal too much information. And at the same time, they are limited in what they can do. 
and public perception is awful a lot of the times. Yeah. And then they have these awful takes like inflation is transitory, which is true, just depending on what your definition of transitory is, mm, that, if it's a, a month one. or a quarter or three years, whatever it might be for transitory. So I think it's too soon, even for Miss Yellen to call it. Um, I think we need to see what the first quarter of 24 is going to look like. And I think that will be the deciding moment for what we see in the labor market. And that's going to dictate everything moving from there. We're already starting to see some downward movements in the ADP employment report for um, leisure and hospitality. Something that's been propping up a lot of service spending. Thanks Taylor Swift. Thanks Beyonce. Thanks Drake. All, all of the above. And so... That's starting mm -hmm. to kind of slow down and ease, even though it's still above your ago levels. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a concern going into the new year as well. Yeah. Uh, the last thing that kind of supports a little bit of a softer landing and freight, <laughs> nonetheless, the last article written by Alan Adler, uh, class eight orders at 14 month high in November. Um, this one is crazy <laughs> to me. <laughs> and, and this is a good one to end on because I'm shocked at how resilient this is. Now, this definitely says that you know, it actually helps support some of that demand side stuff, but they're basically saying that they're still replacing trucks. Like they're going out of style, but I still think that this is a result of not replacing trucks during the pandemic. That's what I was going to ask you. Is this yeah. just because a lot of folks have older fleets and they're we looking- We still got a few months to go before we can like really say that we have passed through that pandemic. You know, it, it's taken so long. We talked about the inventory levels, recognizing your inventories are high. Yeah. You have this mess after COVID and people started like addressing the mess. And I still think we're doing that. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Fredonomics. Thank you to Thompson Reuters for <laughs> yeah, check this out, sponsorship. Download your free copy of their uh, their report. Thompson Reuters 2023 Global Trade Survey Report. I still haven't shaved. I don't think I'm going to shave for a little bit.